welcome to our session this morning, Theological Perspectives on Evolution. My name is Matt Ashley, and I'm in the Theology Department, and I'm delighted to moderate our proceedings this morning. We have two speakers, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Let me just uh, go over for you the format. Um, similar to the session, um, <coughs> the other uh, plenary sessions, that is, each uh, speaker will present uh, his or her paper, and then we'll have a few questions from the floor, and I'd ask you to confine those questions to matters of information or clarification. Then, after the two presenters have given their papers and had those initial questions, I will ask both of them to come to the table here with the microphones and begin by commenting briefly on each of the, uh, on the other's paper, and then we will have questions from the floor that can be directed to one or the other, or both of them. As in the past, I would ask you to use the microphones, which are here um, back there, uh, one on my left and one immediately in front of me. And that will be our format for this morning. <coughs> our first speaker is William Carroll. Dr. William Carroll is the Thomas Aquinas Fellow in Science and Religion at Blackbriars Hall and a member of the Faculty of Theology at the University of Oxford. He is the author of La Creación y las Ciencias Naturales, Actualidad de Santo Tomás de Aquino, and co-author with Stephen Baldner of Aquinas on Creation. Among his many recent articles are Thomas Aquinas on Science, Sacra Doctrina, and Creation, and at the Mercy of Chance, Evolution, and the Catholic Tradition. He will speak this morning on After Darwin, Aquinas, a universe created and evolving. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carroll. Thank you. I think the dean drank some of my water, so. Uh, uh, good morning, it's good to see some uh, Notre Dame uh, students here. I was an undergraduate in the 60s, and uh, it's good to be, see that they're up at this hour in the morning, but of course, back in a time when the university was really rigorous, uh, my freshman year, I had French at eight o'clock in the morning, six days a week, for the entire freshman year, so uh, I'm used to, uh, I'm sure it's much easier now at Notre Dame. Uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this conference, Jerry McKenney, Phil Sloan, Catherine Engelson, and others for putting together a, an excellent uh, conference and being wonderful hosts for myself and for indeed for, uh, for all of us. It's a uh, privilege for me to be here uh, and to speak with you this morning. Also, uh, if you would like a copy of what I'm going to uh, say this morning, you can send me an email uh, and uh, I will send you by back by email attachment the text of my remarks this morning. <coughs> uh, as with all the uh, speakers, there is a much longer version which will be uh, published. But if you'd like a copy of this, just uh, uh, ask me for my uh, email address and I will uh, provide it. You'll notice also that as with Archbishop Shashinsky, uh, the logos is primary, no pictures, uh, <laughs> uh, just words, uh, uh, well, yeah, some words at least. Huh? Uh, at, the, um, two, at the 2000 Jubilee Session for Scientists held at the Vatican in May of that year, Archbishop Joseph Shashinsky offered an eloquent assessment of contemporary discourse on the relationship between the natural sciences and theology. The Archbishop ended his address with the comment that what is needed today is a new Thomas Aquinas. I remember remarking to him after his speech that I thought the old Thomas Aquinas would do just fine at least the principles which informed Thomas Aquinas' philosophy and theology remain of enduring value as we seek to probe ever more deeply into our understanding of nature, of human nature, and of God. Professor John Hart of Georgetown University uh, 
has written that after the life and work of Charles Darwin, any thoughts we may have about God can hardly remain the same as before. Although evolutionary science has significantly changed our view of the world, I am not persuaded that our thoughts about God need to undergo a radical revision. Of course, it depends upon the particular thoughts about God to which one is referring. As long as we think of God, John Hort writes, as long as you think of God only in terms of order or design, the atheism of many evolutionists will seem appropriate. More generally, the claim is that the novelty, the dynamism, the chance, and self-organizing principles in nature are not consistent with an omnipotent, omniscient, immutable, and timeless God, especially a God described in categories of Aristotelian philosophy, or at least categories which have their roots in Aristotelian philosophy. The conceit of my title, after Darwin, Aquinas, is meant to suggest that the challenges which evolutionary biology present to theology do not so much demand a new theism as they offer an opportunity to reappropriate insights of Thomas Aquinas, especially concerning the doctrine of creation, God's transcendence, and God's action in the world. One source of confusion is to see God's creative act essentially as the explanation for order and design in nature. That is, to identify creation with the causing of order and design. As evolutionary biology, for example, claims to be able to explain order and design, without an appeal to an orderer or designer, but on the basis of natural processes, it appears to many that there is no longer a role for God to play. But the God who, after Darwin, must either be rejected altogether or to be seen in new terms, is not really the God described by Thomas Aquinas. After Darwin, we have new reasons, I think, for returning to the thought of Thomas Aquinas on these and related topics. In fact, a return to Aquinas would help to diffuse much of the confusion in contemporary discourse about evolution, a discourse which can easily become obscured in broader political, social, and philosophical contexts. Rather, I would say, as I uh, say often uh, to uh, uh, high school educators, is that rather than exclude Darwin from the curriculum, one should include Thomas Aquinas in the curriculum. Well, anyway, today, the choice for many seems to be between a purely natural explanation of the origin and development of life, an explanation in terms of common descent, genetic mutations, and natural selection, on the one hand, and on the other hand, an explanation which sees divine agency as the direct and immediate source of life in all its diversity, and that human beings created in the image and likeness of God have a special place in the universe. The difference thus to many appears stark, either Darwin or God, as it's sometimes put. This sense of a fundamental incompatibility between creation and evolution is itself enmeshed in a wider intellectual framework which affirms a kind of totalizing naturalism. And I have a footnote here to Philip Sloan, who's, uh, he might not be the originator of this uh, phrase, totalizing naturalism, but at least he's the proximate cause for my use of it. Huh? Uh, there is this wider framework which affirms a kind of totalizing naturalism according to which the universe and the processes within it need no explanation beyond the categories of the natural sciences. Thus, only the emergence of new things from already existing things 
or they're going out of existence, or other varieties of change, only these need to be explained. What does not need to be explained, so this position contends, is the mere existence of that which changes. The argument is that the natural sciences are fully sufficient, at least in principle, to account for all that needs to be accounted for in the universe. In contemporary biology, there have been important discussions about understanding living things in terms of self-organization. And as reductionism and mechanism are being replaced by appeals to dynamic, intrinsic organizing principles, the conclusion often reached is that changes in nature are exhaustively based on principles and entities in the natural world and that there is no need for any external interference to explain the change. I often travel to uh, both Argentina and to Chile, and uh, Chile is famous in the academic world of the natural sciences for two biologists, Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana, who developed notions of autopoiesis, of a kind of self-creation in, uh, in living things. Now, these broadly philosophical claims, namely that self-creation and self-sufficiency evident in the natural order eliminate the need, the need to appeal to God, these claims about the self-sufficiency of the natural order involve conceptions of God and creation which, even if shared by some believers, are really not the same as those found in traditional philosophy and theology. So an important point I want to argue this morning is that to defend the competence of the natural sciences to describe what happens in nature ought not to be equated with a denial of creation. Although many theologians do see the poverty of arguments which absolutize the natural order, they tend to think that the challenges of science, of contemporary science, require us to reformulate what it means for God to create. Reformulations which, as I've suggested, require an abandonment of notions of divine immutability, timelessness, and omnipotence. Now, these reformulations, these new theisms, huh? these reformulations range from various forms of process theology to a kind of canotic theology which views God as withdrawing or self-limiting in order to provide a kind of space, as it were, for natural things to operate. But surely the old view of God as omnipotent, timeless, immutable, must be reformulated, must be rejected, and new notions of God must be reformulated in order to take into account, so the argument goes, in order to take into account what the contemporary natural sciences tell us about the world. And I've said, the theologians who make these arguments uh, rightly see uh, the error of absolutizing the natural order uh, in such a way as to embrace a kind of atheism, but their solution to the, uh, of a, for a response to the uh, new sciences is to change in significant ways our conception of God. Now what I want to do uh, now is to defend a Thomistic analysis of creation and the relative self-sufficiency of nature against both the new atheism and the various theological attempts to alter fundamentally what we mean by God as creator. In a way, a return to Thomas is supported by the insights of Darwinian and neo-Darwinian thought. After Darwin, we should no longer accept those notions of creation and divine agency which are incompatible with an evolving universe in which there is real novelty and in which the processes of development can be explained by principles in the universe. And I think that Thomas Aquinas remains an excellent guide for coming to terms with 
God after Darwin. As Thomas would argue, the processes which evolutionary biology explains depend upon God's creative act. For Thomas, nature contains intrinsic principles of dynamic activity and integrity which is not challenged by a robust notion of divine omnipotence, but indeed an integrity which is made possible by the very divine omnipotence. Now, medieval discussions about creation, and at Oxford, my principal teaching is on the development of the doctrine of creation in medieval Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, a development which occurred in the context of the reception of Greek science and philosophy, primarily the metaphysics and uh, physics uh, of Aristotle. At medieval discussions about the intelligibility of creation, of divine agency, and the autonomy of nature, and ultimately of the very possibility of the natural sciences discovering real causes in nature, those medieval discussions provide a rich source of insight for us today. What Avicenna, Maimonides, and Thomas Aquinas, for example, saw so clearly that creation is an account of the existence of things, not of changes in and among things, allows us to conclude that there is no contradiction between creation so understood and any conclusion whatsoever in the natural sciences. The natural sciences of the ancient and medieval world, the natural sciences of the early modern world, and the contemporary natural sciences. So the natural sciences have as their domain the world of changing things. That is their area of explanation. Whether the changes so described are biological or cosmological, whether the changes are without beginning or end, or whether the changes are temporally finite, they remain processes. The key to Thomas Aquinas' analysis is the distinction he draws between creation and change, or as he often remarked, creatio non est mutatio. Creation is not a change. Crea <coughs> creation as a metaphysical and theological notion affirms that all that is in whatever way or ways it is, depends upon God as cause. The natural sciences, whether Aristotelian, with which Thomas was primarily concerned, or those of our own day, have as their subject the world of changing things, from subatomic particles to acorns to galaxies. Whenever there is a change, there must be something that changes. Creation, on the other hand, is the radical causing of the whole existence of whatever exists. To cause completely something to exist is not to produce a change in something, is not to work on or with some existing material, is not to bring order to chaos or design where there is no design. So if in producing something new, an agent were to use something already existing, the agent would not be the complete cause of the new thing. But such complete causing is precisely what creation is. To create is to cause existence, and all things are totally dependent upon the creator for the very fact that they are. As Thomas remarks in On Separated Substances, quote, over and above the mode of becoming by which something comes to be through change or motion, there must be a mode of becoming or origin of things without any mutation or motion through the influx of being. Modern arguments about order and design 
like medieval arguments about motion and an unmoved mover, are arguments in natural philosophy, not in metaphysics. To the extent that to create is susceptible to rational examination, and it was for Thomas, to the extent that to create is susceptible to rational examination, it is a topic in metaphysics, not in natural philosophy, nor in the individual empirical sciences. Furthermore, for Thomas, creation is not primarily some distant event. Rather, it is the ongoing, complete causing of the existence of all that is. At this very moment, were God not causing all that is to exist, from quantum processes to the color of the sky, to our own thoughts, hopes, and dreams, were God not to be causing everything that is, there would be nothing at all. God is so powerful that what happens occurs in the way which God wills it to happen. God's will transcends and constitutes the whole hierarchy of created causes, both causes which always and necessarily produce their effects and causes which at times fail to produce their effects either through deficiencies in their power or deficiencies in the material upon which they work. Indeed, as I suggested last night to Archbishop Shashinsky, we can say that God causes chance events to be chance events. The role of chance mutation at the genetic level, so important in current evolutionary theory, does not call into question God's creative act. God is the cause <coughs> of being as such, and to cause being as such is precisely what to create means. God's causation does not compete with the causation of creatures, but rather supports and grounds it. God is not another cause among causes. God is not the most powerful cause among other causes. Huh? since it's characteristic of the causes in nature precisely to be causes, God's causal determination of them is not such as to deny their proper autonomy. God causes the causes in nature to be the kind of causes which they are. Contrary to the view of some contemporary theologians, God does not need a metaphysical indeterminacy in nature so that his actions would not collide, so to speak, with other causes. There is a very uh, significant uh, international discussion about divine agency in the context of contemporary science, uh, jointly sponsored by the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences at, the Va at Berkeley and the Vatican Observatory. And one of the sort of sustaining uh, notions throughout uh, these uh, uh, various conferences held on divine agency in contemporary science is that the metaphysical indeterminacy associated especially with quantum mechanics provides a wonderful new opening for a theology of divine action so that God can be said to act in the metaphysical space the indeterminate space provided or at least argued for by uh, uh, certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so theologians have been, many theologians have been attracted to this metaphysical indeterminacy because it provides, a, 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 as I said, a kind of space in the world in which God can be said to act without interfering. Huh? I think that such uh, attraction for metaphysical indeterminacy as a way, as a venue for divine action uh, flows from misunderstandings of what it means for God to act in the first place. And that's what I want to turn to a little bit here about divine agency and the self-sufficiency of nature. The problem which those who defend a self-sufficiency in nature and its processes often see is that any appeal to a cause outside of nature 
is either superfluous or contradictory to the very claim that nature is the domain of self-organizing principles. Either we don't need to appeal to God because nature is self-sufficient, or if we start appealing to God, we are then denying the real self-organizing principles in nature. There is here a confusion between different orders or levels of explanation. For Thomas, there is no question that there are real causes in the natural order. If no created thing really produced effects, then he says no nature of anything would ever be known through its effect, and thus all the knowledge of natural sciences is taken away from us. There must be real causes in nature. And Thomas thinks that to defend the fact that creatures are real causes, to defend the autonomy of nature, far from challenging divine omnipotence, is a powerful argument for divine omnipotence. As he says, to deny the power of creatures to be the causes of things is to detract from the perfection of creatures and thus to detract from the perfection of divine power. Thomas shows us how to distinguish between the being or existence of creatures and the operations they perform. God causes creatures to exist in such a way that they are the real causes of their own operations. For Thomas, God is at work in every operation of nature without compromising the autonomy of nature. It is, of course, important to recognize that for Thomas, divine causality and creaturely causality, and creaturely causality includes the causality of subatomic particles, etc., that divine causality and creaturely causality function at fundamentally different levels. In, summa, in the Summa Contra Gentiles, Thomas remarks, quote, that the same effect is not attributed to a natural cause and to divine power in such a way that it is partly done by God and partly by the natural agent. Rather, it, the effect, is wholly done by both according to a different way. It is not the case, you see, of partial or co-causes with each contributing a separate element to produce the effect. God doesn't provide some of the causality and creatures some of the other causality, and that together they constitute uh, in some way the whole causality. Each creature and God is the whole cause. Huh? For Thomas, the differing metaphysical levels of primary and secondary causation require us to say that any created effect comes totally and immediately from God as the transcendent primary cause, and totally and immediately from the creature as secondary cause. You can see here how Thomas can defend the self-organizing principles of nature, the autonomy of nature. In response to the objection that it is superfluous for effects to flow from natural causes, since they could just as well be directly caused by God alone, Thomas writes that the existence of real secondary causes is not the result of the inadequacy of divine power, but of the immensity of God's goodness. God wills to communicate his likeness to things, not only that they might exist, but that they might also be causes for other things. So to ascribe to God as first cause all causal agency, Thomas says, eliminates the order of the universe, which is woven together through the order and connection of causes. For the first cause lends from the eminence of its goodness, not only to other things that they are, but also to those things that they are causes. If God's creative act were to cease, every operation would cease. Every operation of a thing has God as its ultimate cause. 
he is a cause in such a way that nature has its own integrity, its own self-organizing principles. Creation for Thomas concerns, first of all, the origin of the universe, not its temporal beginning. Indeed, it is important to recognize his distinction between origin and beginning. To speak of origin is to affirm the complete, continuing dependence of all that is on God as cause. Thomas does, of course, believe that the universe is temporally finite, a truth revealed only in scripture. But even if the universe were eternal, it still would depend upon God for its existence. It still would be created. One of Thomas's great contributions in medieval discussions of this topic was to defend the intelligibility of a universe eternal and created. No contradiction between an eternal universe and a created universe, although, as he would say, uh, he believes as a matter of faith that the universe is eternal. Actually, that he believes as a matter of faith that the universe is temporally finite. But even if it were the case that the universe were eternal, it still would be created. Now, the source of most of the difficulties in grasping an adequate understanding of the relationship between the created order and God, an understanding which I've been sketching briefly, the source of most of the difficulties in grasping this understanding is the failure to understand divine transcendence. It is God's very transcendence, a transcendence beyond any contrast with imminence, which enables God to be intimately present in the world as cause. God is not transcendent in such a way that he is outside or above or beyond the world. God is not different from creatures in the way in which creatures differ from one another. We might say that God differs differently from the created order. God operates imminently in nature in such a way that he sets nature, so to speak, free in its own operation. Thomas sees God as a cause which by his transcending imminence constitutes the causality of nature in its own order. Too much of modern theism has a kind of, has a view of transcendence uh, which William Placker calls a domesticated transcendence, a misunderstanding uh, of uh, at least the medieval discussion of what it means for God to be transcendent. So this notion of a kind of Tra domesticated transcendence and its emphasis on accounting for God's agency in the world, especially God as designer or orderer, has ultimately proved intellect provided intellectual support for the view that we can just as well do without any, out any reference to God or at least to a God so conceived. So misunderstanding God's transcendence and the view of God as a cause, a big cause, a powerful cause in nature, producing order and design, that conception of God as, that conception of what it means for God to be cause, ultimately has provided intellectual support for the view that we can just as well do without any need for such a God. Nature is sufficient on its own. But as I've argued, this God so conceived, this God, which ultimately is rejected, huh, is hardly the God about whom Thomas Aquinas speaks. If we follow Thomas's lead, we can see that there is no need to choose between a robust view of creation as the constant exercise of divine omnipotence and the causes disclosed by the natural sciences. We don't have to have God withdrawing. We don't have to have God limiting himself in order for nature to have its own integrity. In fact, for Thomas, just the opposite. The extent, if God were to withdraw, there would be no autonomy for nature. 
God's creative power is exercised throughout the entire course of cosmic history in whatever way that history has unfolded. No matter how random one thinks evolutionary change is, for example, no matter how much one thinks that natural selection is the master mechanism of change in the world of living things, the role of God as creator, as continuing cause of the whole reality of all that is, is not challenged. We need to remember Thomas's fundamental point that creation is not a change and that there is no possibility of conflict between the explanatory domain of the natural sciences, the world of change, and that of creation. So, in conclusion, for Thomas, the complete dependence of all that is on God does not challenge an appropriate autonomy of natural causation. God is not a competing cause in a world of other causes. In fact, God's causality is such that he causes creatures to be the kind of causal agents which they are. In an important sense, there would be no autonomy to the natural order were not God causing it to be so. There would be no evolutionary processes at all where God's not creating them to be and to be what they are. Traditional conceptions of God as creator certainly need not be abandoned in order to embrace an evolving universe in which real novelty and contingency are characteristic features of nature. The account Thomas offers of divine agency and the autonomy and integrity of nature, that account is not merely an artifact from the past, it is, I think, an enduring legacy. After Darwin, we are able to see, perhaps more clearly than before, Thomas's point that creation is not a change, and that as a result of the ongoing creative act of an omnipotent God, nature possesses a dynamism and a self-sufficiency which have been ever more evident to science. Thank you very much. We have time now for a few questions, and again, I'd ask you to go to the uh, microphones. Joseph Zuczynski, if you don't mind, Bill, in a short note, I would like to defend John Hoth, his after Darwin statement yeah. that really, <laughs> after theory of evolution, there are so important changes in many domains that we Christian intellectuals have to answer the challenges. And as an example, I would provide changes in philosophical and uh, theological anthropology. I could notice easily that scientists are focused upon their uh, scientific technical aspects. Philosophers are focused upon uh, human dignity understood in metaphysical terms. And these two words are quite different words. And when during a public discussion you would like to refer to the dignity of human person, the first question from the audience is, what do you mean dignity? Mm -hmm. I uh, attended a conference during which we prepared the declaration about human dignity and it had no chance to pass because most of the participants had no concept of dignity in post-Darwinian intellectual landscape. So one of the participants uh, proposed a compromise instead of dignity to introduce the worth of human person. But worth could be interpreted financially. It is quite different what dignity is. So we need this dialogue, and if philosophers would be ignore Darwin and post-Darwinian contribution to science, it would be a disaster. Yeah. 
We already practiced in the past. We, there was already practice in the past such an attitude, and the consequences were too high to be paid. Another, another example, the uh, vision of the evolving universe and human place in it. In the time of Darwin, they believed in the young, uh, young Earth. Now we know that the present form of the evolving universe has at least 13.7 billion years. So 13.7 billion years, practically without human observer, because we have traces of the so-called mitochondrial eva, eva of 100, 125,000 years ago. It means 99.99% of human history without human observer. What will be our future? Here is our intellectual responsibility, our Christian responsibility, and we must answer. And personally, I'm deeply gr grateful to John Hoth for his answers because they counteract this obsession that the people are ashamed of their animal roots. Some philosophers do. Yeah. They are not ashamed that there are electrons in uh, their bodies. Can uh, you do a question, they, please? Uh, well, I, um, uh, I think Archbishop Krzyzynski, uh, uh, <laughs> with respect to the Episcopal office, misunderstood my talk. I focused on the question of creation and of divine transcendence and divine agency, I div which is relatively easy to make clear. I left aside issues in natural philosophy, in questions of understanding human nature, of all the questions with respect to understanding the world and, the and human beings and their place in the world, and Thomas Aquinas would be the first to say that as we come to talk about nature and human nature, we must be au courant with the best that science has to offer, and that would include uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, the issue, however, and that's of course what John Hort would say, what I would have issue with John Hort, and it's not in this, uh, on this topic, uh, in this paper, is that he thinks that traditional natural philosophy must be rejected in terms of some kind of process philosophy, and I think that is also false. Uh, when he talks about the need for a metaphysics of becoming rather than a metaphysics of being, I think that is also wrong. <laughs> but I'm not, by saying this, I don't want to reject the insights of contemporary science at all, I want to reject what I think would be the false conclusion that the insights of contemporary science are incompatible with principles of traditional natural philosophy. The insights of contemporary science are incompatible with any number of conclusions in Aristotelian science or Thomistic science and so forth, and we must reject those false conclusions which modern science has shown us. The dynamism of nature, the evolving nature, the emergent principles, all of that must be incorporated into a natural philosophy. And then the question comes, is traditional natural philosophy able to or not able to incorporate the insights of contemporary science? But I don't want to build a wall against the insights of contemporary science at all. I want to reject the argument which says that we must reject traditional natural philosophy in order to be au courant with contemporary science. Now that's the question of how can substance and form and matter, how can that fit in with evolution? That's a big topic in natural philosophy. I wanted to clear the air simply on the question of creation and divine agency to show that there are no problems at all. There are problems in natural philosophy, but that's, I think, another talk. Um, Carl Helrich, Goshen College. Uh, I am aware of your comment, the person who uh, is on the other side of your comments about the use of the, of, uh, the indeterminacy principle of Heisenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as a physicist, I also agree with you that that is an inadequate dodge, if you will, and I, re I realize the source of that is so that we can continue to 
consider physics and still have an open gap someplace. Mm -hmm. I want to say only that, and you, you're probably aware of what I'm going to say, is that the driver of the non-equilibrium that we like to discuss here is the second law of thermodynamics mm -hmm. since the work of Ilya Prigogine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also aware that we cannot get any closer than the first order distribution function two of those atoms and molecules we like to talk about. Mm -hmm. So what I'm venturing here is that, yes, you're right, we should not look at quantum mechanics uh, in this question, nor should we actually try to discover why God is hiding. Uh, but I do think that we do have a barrier here that we just cannot tear down. Mm -hmm. God is always acting at the system level in biology. The second law is a system law. And there is a barrier there that we know of now, theoretically, since the 1990s, that we can't get to the molecule. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you, yes. Uh, I think the f a fundamental error in all these contemporary debates about uh, divine agency and contemporary science and metaphysical indeterminacy is, as I suggested, a failure adequately to understand what is meant by divine transcendence, that God's transcend is such that he that God can be fully imminent in the natural order, not as a competing cause. So whatever the natural order is like, whether it's a Newtonian mechanism, whether it's an Aristotelian natural order, whether it's the natural order of Niels Bohr, it doesn't matter from the point of view of understanding divine agency. Now, it does matter if we want to understand what is the natural order like, then yes, we have to raise all these, sorts of, all these types of questions. But to understand what it means for God to be acting in the natural order, our understanding of what the natural order is, is in a way irrelevant. Bill, I, uh, I am really very sympathetic with the wall of your relation. And I share really a lot of what you have said. But I think that we must find here a sort of intelligent compromise. Because uh, to tell that uh, science and theology and philosophy can be, uh, must be kept a little bit apart, each on its uh, their own part, it is not very helpful. Uh, I, am, I totally agree with you that we don't need the transfers from quantum mechanics or from which science directly to theology and philosophy because this is a little bit childish. But on the other hand, if we don't understand that science does with knowledge, and also philosophy is interested in knowledge, that science has uh, certain consequences in the way which we understand being, this would be also childish, I think. And you know, uh, somebody that you will probably consider uh, a relevant figure in our debate, Cardinal Cotier, in our last uh, March conference in Rome, told publicly uh, during his speech that uh, evolution theory since it's centered on a sort of dynamicity principle, as something new to tell to philosophy, because philosophy never seriously considered it before that. So I, I'm sure that we don't need a new Thomas of Aquinas, and this is clear, but we need to catch the spirit of Thomas and Aquinas and to, to do today something that similarly, something sufficiently intelligent to put things together that are not so easily to put together. Mm -hmm. Jacques Maritain said, we must distinguish in order to unite. Yes, and we must do both. Uh, otherwise, we don't have proper unity of knowledge. Huh? So I want to keep apart metaphysical reflections and theological reflections on, the, on what creation is from questions in the natural sciences and natural philosophy about change so that we don't confuse our categories of analysis. We need all these categories of analysis, but we must keep them distinct. Huh? No, 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 that's why you said, I, you said you don't want, it's not helpful to keep them apart. My point is, that's precisely what is helpful, is to keep them apart so we do not confuse different areas of discourse, number one. It is true that the developments in evolutionary biology, for example, 
the novelty, the change, the dynamism of nature, all of that needs to be incorporated in any natural philosophy. So that if one wishes to defend a Thomistic notion of form and matter, Form has to be seen in a much more dynamic way than Thomas Aquinas saw form. Furthermore, the, the potentialities in matter are far richer even than Thomas Aquinas thought. Uh, so, and, that, and there would be an example of how one should use the insights of contemporary science. But we use those insights in natural philosophy, this more general science of nature, but those insights are irrelevant to a metaphysical understanding of what creation is, because creation is understood as cause of existence of whatever it is, in whatever way it is. It's not an explanation of change. In the categories of explaining change, in natural philosophy and the individual scientists, there we need, if, we, if one wishes, to use traditional concepts, there we need to make sure that those traditional concepts are open to and incorporate the uh, discoveries of the contemporary sciences. Okay, this will be our last question for this Kemp, stage. Kemp from the University of St. Thomas. Let me make a proposal which uh, maybe can pull us a little bit uh, together, your view and, and uh, views of, of John Potter and Archbishop Suchinsky. Suppose that we think of the kind of three-stage development in the doctrine of creation. So the first stage is what we get in Scripture, and particularly in the mm. Old Testament, the dependence of the world on God, ex annihilation, mm. and so on. That, that being presented theologically, it needs uh, two steps of incorporation into a broader kind of intellectual vision. The first step taken in the Middle Ages, which integrates this theological doctrine with the metaphysics and philosophy of nature in the way you've emphasized. But seeing that philosophy of nature is basically synchronic, describing the way the world works. Mm -hmm. The second stage that comes in the 19th and 20th century is an integration of this doctrine of creation with historical sciences, which were not a uh, feature of the medieval intellectual world that Thomas was, was working on. And so in that sense, maybe Watt's statement is an exaggeration, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we need to integrate the doctrine of creation with historical sciences just as we need it in the 13th century to integrate it with uh, mm. metaphysics and philosophy of nature. Now, I don't agree, because yeah. to integrate creation into the historical sciences makes, it uh, seems to me, uh, compromises the fundamental fact that, meta that creation is essentially a metaphysical notion and not about the and not a historical claim about the beginning of the universe that would be a, that would be a concern sort of theological issues with respect to uh, uh, cre uh, with respect to creation. let me say one one point here in in his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard Thomas is talking about the debate uh, uh, between Augustinians and others, so what does the opening of Genesis mean? Uh, is everything created all at once, or is there a sequence of creation? And Thomas says, what is essential to the faith is the fact of creation, not the manner or mode of formation of the world. And he, said, and he says, that's what Genesis is the fundamental point, is the fact of creation, not the manner or mode. The manner or mode concerns the historical sciences, concerns the natural sciences, but the fact of creation is different from the question of the manner or mode of formation of the world. And that's a great insight that Thomas has when, when, we, when we wanted to talk, if we were wanting to talk about how Thomas reads the opening of Genesis with respect to questions of creation. And that would be... Just as Augustine's, uh, Ken Miller cited Augustine's on the literal meaning of Genesis, Augustine and Aquinas have a lot to teach us about how to, uh, how to read uh, uh, the opening of Genesis in the light of science. I just meant that at the end of the day we need to have a view. We don't have time for uh -huh. a, a follow-up. We need to move on. So please join me in thanking our first speaker.